happen to everyone watching us live on YouTube. You're welcome to today's session of Legacy Series. Um, and this session is quite interesting because we are in the family month at Akari Church, that's August. And we have with us um, a couple, doctor and doctor, <laughs> um, uh, Alex and Margaret Amakapuku. Um, so they will be um, chatting with us today. And so I would want to give um, a bit of a background um, on their profiles. And I'll start with Dr. Margaret Amakapuku. Yes, so Dr. Margaret is a senior lecturer at the Department of Psychology at the University of Ghana. She is a qualified clinical and health psychologist who has practical experience in clinical psychology practice, teaching and research. And she currently holds the position of the 18th Warden of Volta Hall at the University of Ghana. And um, she was born in July 1972 and she had her education um, starting from nursery at the Achimota Primary School, um, after which she continued to the secondary school as well, where she was even an athlete for her house. And um, she continued to do her sixth form at Swedru Secondary School, where she also participated in sports. And in 1993, September 1993, she entered the University of Ghana and graduated in 97 with a degree in psychology with religions. She also um, continued after school, she continued her national service at the Department of Psychology as well as a teaching assistant. And um, in September she, in 2018, she continued to pursue a postgraduate degree in clinical psychology at the University of Ghana and she completed her program in 2021. Also, um, she has served, and she has continued in the University of Ghana um, after school to teach in the psychology department. And uh, she later went to do her PhD as well um, at the University of Birmingham, uh, that's in health psychology. And after which she came back to continue teaching at the department of psychology. And as I said earlier, she's currently the warden of Volta Hall at the University of Ghana and was, in, was um, installed as the warden this year, that is January 2022. She's a committed Christian who loves to serve in the house of God, and she's a member of the Akrari Church, where she's currently a lay reader and a member of the Couples Fellowship. She's also a lay preacher at the at Akrari Church um, Contemporary Service. And she's also been trained as a marriage counselor. She's married to Dr. Alex Amakapuku, and they have three children. That is Kweku, Ikria, and Abena. So that is for Dr. Margaret. Such um, a great profile there. And also for Dr. Alex, um, he was born in the northern region of Ghana and had his education um, at Temali. That's where he started from. Um, he continued to Accra Academy for his secondary education and later continued to University of Ghana to pursue a BSc degree in computer science and statistics, after which he pursued a master's degree in business administration. And he obtained his PhD in business administration as well from the um, CAS Uni European Institute of Management Studies in France. For his work experience, he has um, w he has worked in different areas covering public finance management, public sector budgeting, internal audits, um, as well as social research, information technology, system analysis, design and project management as well. After his first degree, he worked at Data Processing Center at the University of Ghana um, for his national service um, period before continuing as a research and MIS officer at the Planned Parenthood Association of Ghana. From there, he continued to work with the Securities and Exchange Commission in Ghana, where he provided leadership in management information systems. And then um, he later became a director, one of the youngest directors actually, in the public service when he was engaged as a director for planning, research, um, information systems, and then monitoring and evaluation at the in internal audit agency. 
From there, he continued to work with Edits Limited in Birmingham, UK, as an IT support specialist. And then he returned to Ghana to consult for the Danish International Development Agency, after which he um, moved to work with the Ministry of Finance. So he's currently um, with the Ministry of Finance, working as the head of budget development and reforms. And he assists the director of budgets in developing the national budget by playing a formulation, coordination, and solidity consolidation role sorry so he indeed just like his wife he also loves the lord so much and he's also a member of the akari church and he's been a member for the past 22 years he is a member of the couples fellowship and he's also a married counselor as well as a, re a lay reader for the services and um, so yes uh, just as is the same for his wife he also of course has three children <coughs> Um, Kweku, <laughs> yeah, Kweku, Ikria, and Abena as well. Yes, so that's more or less a brief profile on our guest for today, and we are really happy to have you. I think it's quite an interesting <laughs> story you have, you know, and we are happy to have you. So we'd like to just give you the platform to also add on any information you have for us. All right, Esinam, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for this opportunity uh, to come and share our story. In fact, when um, Reverend Ankama invited us and I saw a balanced life, later I saw him and I said, so far, are you sure I have a balanced life? But well, I guess that is what people see. And yes, the Lord has been good. And it's been, it's been a balancing act, if I should put it that way. So um, I think if you've um, read about me, basically I school, the Nachimota school. I did my university, I did, um, the, I did my university education at the University of Ghana. And um, I went on to work. Um, it's talking about a balanced life. I've got my work life, I've got my Christian life, I've got my family life. So the question is, how do you juggle all of it? I would say that Faith in God has done it all. Walking, um, um, being a Christian, basically. All my life, or most part of my life, it's just been God that has kept me. Being in Achimota School was a privilege. Today I look back and I say, all the friends that I have are from Achimota School. My closest friends, let me put it that way, not all my friends, but my closest friends come from there. And we have a strong social bond, and that helps a lot in the balancing act. Because you know, you work, you have family, but you've got to socialize as well. So that helps a lot. In terms of work, um, like you mentioned, I did my national service. Um, when I finished my first degree, I did my national service at the Department of Psychology. And then I did my master's. And I'm um, sorry, I think I made an error with my profile. So uh -huh. I did my master's in 1998. Uh -huh. yes, no, yes, yes, 1998. That's when I started. And um, that's where I started from. And that is where I still am. Um, so I did, uh, as part of my thesis, I collected my data from the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. I do research on diabetes. And um, so I collected my data from there. I met this professor who um, liked me so much. He was a very strict professor, but for some reason, he liked me. And that's one of the blessings that I have from God. I have a lot of people who I come into contact with who show a lot of love towards me. It's always been a blessing. And so after I finished my um, master's, he offered me a job as a research assistant. And so I worked at the National Diabetes Research Center. I worked for a year. And then came National Reconciliation. And then I applied and I was recruited as a counselor. And then I worked with National Reconciliation for a couple of months. And then um, actually we had to, at that time they said the government was not paying the commissioners and all of that. So in the end, yes, at that time. <laughs> so some of us workers had to go. And I was one of them because we had a lot of counselors. But then CDD at that time employed us to continue, to pay us to be able to continue with a job. And then just around that time, if I was speaking with a friend, a colleague, and she said, oh, 
the head of the department of psychology is looking for you because he wants you to come and teach. But he said, I told him that he said he, he sees you on TV because of national reconciliation, so he knows you are not available. And I said, oh, I'm available. So I called him the next day. I went to see him. He said, the faculty is traveling to do his um, PhD abroad, so we need a replacement. So it, within a matter of a week or two, I was walking into a class of 700 students. Yes, school had begun in September. There was no lecturer for that course. And then they said, okay, you just come and introduce yourself. Let them know there's a lecturer. So I just walked in there. And so I actually started teaching, I think, 2nd October. And then I didn't get interviewed till December. Even with that one, I had to go and see the registrar and uh, ask, I mean, what is going on? And he said, oh, there's an interview next Tuesday. Are you ready? Can you join? I said, why, what does it take to be ready? I'm ready. <laughs> And it was quite a successful one. I say this because now, if you want a job in the university, the process that you have to go through, but I got in there and I've been there, I worked, I went to do my PhD, I came back and um, I've been there. I like the fact that um, I'm able to impact the life of the students. I enjoy teaching, I enjoy teaching very much. But it's not easy. People think that it's easy to teach because once school vacates, you also go on holidays. But when school vacates, that is when we have to grade the thousand scripts and all of that. And so it's, it's difficult. I remember there were times where before I went to do my PhD, I'll mark till 3 a.m., then I'll sleep at 3, then I wake up at 5, and then I go to work, then I come back. So it's, it's back to back. School reopens, you teach. School vacates, you're marking. There's no break, but it's, you just have to balance it. And then I had my family. Of course, I had three children. You mentioned Kweku, Ekuia, and Abena. Kweku and Ekuia are twins. And so I had to juggle that as well. Before we traveled, we were in university primary. So I dropped them in school. I picked them when school closes and when I close. And then when we came back from um, the UK, when I went to do my PhD, when we came back also, it was the same juggling of work and family. But for me, I always say family always comes first. For me, family always comes first. Yes, you've got to work. You've got to earn a living to take care of your family. But for me, family always comes first. Um, I say this based on two things that I learned. I had a friend who said um, his father was a lecturer, and all his father wanted to do was to be a professor. So he was just always at his books. He ignored his family, basically. So the children grew up, they grew up knowing their mother and getting close to their mother. And by the time their father got his professorship, they had left home, they were in university, they had made a life for themselves. And so it was too late to build a relationship. The other thing, when I was doing my master's, I was in Valco Trust Hostel. And um, one day uh, on the corridor, my room was the first room, so I heard somebody on the corridor. Was, this man called Mr. Kiche. He was doing um, master's in public, um, I think, health. And he had gone home and come on a Sunday when they had a paper on Monday. And his colleagues were like, oh, you have exam on Monday and you went home during the um, weekend. And he said, if I don't go home now and I finish and I take my certificate home and I go and, and I knock and there's nobody home, there'll be no one to show the certificate to. He told me that family is important. And that has been it for me. Family comes first. Of course, God is above it all, but family, and then work. That is not to say I neglect my work. I do my work as I ought to, but family is important to me. So for me, the children, picking them up from school, it, it did put a strain on my work and uh, my progress in work though. But at the end of the day, I look back and I say, I think I got it right with my family. And I, at the end of the day, God has elevated me in my job as well. So it's, um, for me, like I said, family first, and it's a balancing act. You can't have it all. That is what I've come to notice. You can't have it all. It's, um, it's like, you know how the scale is. Um, you can, it can tilt on one side sometimes. Sometimes it's heavy on one side and it's light on the other. And it's just a matter of an act of balancing it. There are times where work will be up and family will be down, or family will be down, work will be up. But it's just for you to be able to balance it. But again, you can't have it all. Because if you focus just family, you ignore work totally. It will not balance. So it's a balancing act. 
Yes. Yeah, th- th- thank you, Esinam. Um, Margaret mentioned a uh, balancing act. I wouldn't like to speak too much at this juncture. Probably when we zoom into the questions and answers, then we can take it off from there. But what I'd like to add is the fact that it's just like Margaret mentioned, a similar thing happened to me when we were asked to be part of this discussion. The first statement I told Osofo and Kama was, but we are not perfect. <laughs> we have our faults, we have our mistakes, we have our challenges here and there. We try our best to, because it was, a, it was like a, the balanced uh, uh, life. Um, so I said, no, we are not perfect. We try to do our best and we have our challenges. And one thing that he said that kept me was that that is why you've been invited to share your strengths and your weaknesses and then we all learn from it so what i would like to add is in talking about a balanced life just have at the back of your mind that we are as ordinary as you and i we are all the same we all have our own challenges but by the grace of god we working at it and then making sure we become better off um, such that the beauty of christ will be seen in us. Thank you for now. All right, thank you so much um, for that um, introduction. I don't know, it, it already brings a question to mind um, in the sense that, okay, so we, we realize that indeed it's been a case of juggling a lot of things, like you rightly said, Dr. Margaret, that there's work, there's family, you know, there's also church and everything. So. Maybe my question would be, what are some of the practical steps you've taken? Is it that maybe you have a schedule that maybe you have to plan the day before it starts and maybe that's what gets you going? Or do you choose how, what kind of strategies do you put in place? Because I think that's probably one of our biggest struggles right now. We have, we may have all the time in the world as it may seem, but at the same time, we are still not able to manage it anyway. So how is it that maybe for someone who has had it, like a family are able to also give your best at work at the same time what are some of the practical strategies you try to put in place to keep things going okay with that i'll say planning basically planning and time management like you said um do you okay let me say i i just keep a calendar on my on my phone my google um, calendar color coded Kelsey alex he taught me how to do the color coding <laughs> And I put everything in there because it got to a time where I was forgetting stuff. So I put everything in there. I color code it. When I show you my calendar, it looks very, very colorful. Very colorful. <laughs> <laughs> Extremely colorful. But I make sure that if there's anything, I put it in. Once it's in, I won't forget. Because otherwise you miss something. And of course, there are a lot of things that come to you, but you need to choose what is most important to attend to. Sometimes it may be work. Some of the things can wait. But some of the things cannot wait. Sometimes it may be church. Those things can't wait, so they have to be done. So it's proper planning and actually putting pen on paper. So I, have, I have a diary. I keep my diary. But with my, uh, the calendar on my phone, I can see the whole month. So I see everything. So I just put everything in there. When I talk to you and I say, you say, oh, let's have a meeting. Right away, I put it in there. Because if I walk away, I may forget. And so that is how... Um, I, I do that. Just make sure I plan. I have it on my calendar. And then let me say, I'm um, somebody who has a lot of energy. So <laughs> that also helps. <laughs> yeah, um, to add to that, um, I always tell people, plan on paper. We do plan, but people s- sometimes plan in their heads. Yeah. And then it becomes something else. So all I'll add to what Margaret said is plan on paper once you plan on paper you have a plan um and then you pray <laughs> you leave the rest to god one of the things that has helped me is sometimes you'll be surprised as to the team you are working with the potential they have um try and delegate as much as possible some of the tasks that uh, are not fatal if it's not undertaking very well and then you'll be surprised as to how good 
your team members are so that's what i would like to add to what margaret said so plan on paper pray leave the rest to god and then delegate as much as possible as you can and that has kept some of us <laughs> afloat and moving yeah uh, I, I i i plan i plan very well the i think the major problem i have is the delegating part and then also um, sometimes i'm now realizing more than in the past that some things are not as important as you think they are so that's what i'm now learning to reduce that that space so. mm, okay yes um thanks for that um considering that this month too has been family month one thing that has been on my mind as well is how to work in teams you know um you come across different personalities sometimes people are different from you people have different different perspectives or different ideas as to how to go about things and then there's the question of how do you reach a compromise without hurting feelings in the process and all that and i'd like to start with you dr margaret because i really realized from your profile that um i think i saw a statement that um you have a very good and you mentioned it you have a very good relationship with even some some of your mates back from school and you even till date you are you are in contact with them you're able to build such strong relationships i think at a point where i think you noted that um you are quite likable and it's, it's been easy to sort of work with people if i'm not mistaken so um what what are some of maybe the key points you can share with us in in what it i don't know it takes to work in a team or to work with people or deal with people generally considering that you come from different backgrounds okay thank you um i think what i'll just say is um it's just good to observe people first um when you get to know people when you have to work in a team when it's friends etc observe them everybody have their strengths their weaknesses there are things that some people are good at some there are some things that some people are better at and there are some things that people do worse in so it's important to listen to uh, everyone just pay attention listen and then know who can do what for you within a group you would notice that there's somebody who is good at running around there's somebody who is good at providing resources there's somebody who is good at doing the planning so like i said observe people maybe because i'm a psychologist that's how i'm also mm -hmm. saying that but yeah. it's good to observe people first and sometimes we don't give people the chance we write people off too quickly sometimes you need to give people the chance listen to them work with them a bit i mean if let's say you're given a work i mean work to do in a, with a, t a team of people instantly you wouldn't know how people are but if there are people you are going to be working with over the time with time you get to know everybody and their strengths and their weaknesses you get to know what uh, how sensitive somebody is or how um, easygoing somebody is so it's about observing and it's about giving everybody a chance to show what they are made of and then with time, you know how to position everybody and what to um, source from who. Thank you so much. Um, Doc, Dr. Alex, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, um, it's observation bit that, yeah, I, no, once you observe the individuals in the team, you might build some form of uh, perception about them. That is why I said earlier, in delegation, you try it in bits and pieces because there are certain tasks. What I do is quite sensitive. There are certain tasks that if, if they are not able to handle it well, it can affect a whole nation. <laughs> so what do you do? What you do is after you observe, you can try them with some, I use the term, there's a term we use in our office, fatal. So this one is not fatal. So we'll look for the non-fatal tax and then we'll give it to you that like, go and do it. Just give us a report of this. So once you bring us a report, we see the report, we are building upon that. As we are delegating, we are also building capacity. So all the work will not have to depend on you alone, but it becomes a team spirit. So for the teamwork, observe, delegate non-fatal in quotes, <laughs> non-fatal tax. And then based on the feedback that you get from there, you can start giving quite uh, sensitive assignments to the team members. The observation bit, that is quite difficult. But once you're able to observe, you'll be able to delegate the tax as much as possible. 
what I would like to ask is, what kind of characteristics do you guys look out for in people? Um, well, we are all unique in our own sense. Everybody is unique. Everybody has a strength and a weakness. There's a guy in my team who is very good at numbers. He's able to deal with the numbers quite well. And then there's another person who writes very good. So if I'm dealing with issues with numbers, trying to do some trend analysis of budgets or anything of that sort, I know who to go to because I know this guy is good at numbers and I assign that responsibility to him. And then I'll ask him, work with... Um, the storyteller. Yeah, the storyteller. <laughs> because once you turn out the numbers, then the storyteller is able to give the narrative quite well. So I tried putting my people in sub-teams knowing their strengths. I, pay, I see after a while, if I observe and it's not too good, I change. Uh, sometimes you don't like it, but it works well for me. And because some people are so geared on doing a particular thing for years, particularly in the civil service, some of them might not want to change. But in my team, I do a lot of moving around every now and then just to be able to do some uh, permutations and committee, <laughs> uh, just to be able to get the output that I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, did, did, did you, maybe for, um, for Margaret, um, she, maybe psychology helped her <laughs> better understand, but was yours out of experiences or one she of, taught you yeah, no, well, <laughs> once you are married to a psychologist, <laughs> definitely some of her skill will rub over you. Yeah. But as part of my training, I'm also a project management professional, a PMP. Okay. Um, and to be a very good project manager, you need both the hard and the soft skills. So I was also trained to be able to appreciate the soft skills. And I do a lot of observation and team teamwork as well. Even though I think Margaret's skill also rubbed rubbed on me so it is part of my training as a project manager to be able to work with teams it's one of the requirements and once you are not able to do that you never get certified uh, certified as a project management professional so as a pmp part of the training you need both the hard skills and the soft skills the soft skills includes people management human management and all those things team work it's all part of it. So I picked those skills also from my professional training as a professional project manager. Yeah. Okay. And actually, um, I have a question for Dr. Margaret. <laughs> um, it was indicated that you started boarding school at a very, <laughs> very early age. Understatement. <laughs> so so I, in case I didn't mention it earlier, you started <laughs> at the age of six years, am I yes. right? Even SHS level <laughs> was not easy. I just want to ask, what was the experience like, especially starting that early, and in what way has it shaped you to become the person you are today? Okay, yes. I So let me just take you back a bit. My father was um, a music teacher in Achimota School. So we lived on the Achimota School campus. That's where I started my nursery. And then I went to class one. That was in 1979. And then my father had to leave. Um, he left to go and teach in Liberia. So obviously we had to vacate our accommodation on campus, yes. And so I had to go to boarding school. My sister was in class three, I was in class one. So class one third, um, I went to boarding school. Um, I don't quite rem I know that it was a bit strange and odd and lonely moving from a day student to becoming a boarder. But then there were other people like me, also six years maybe even five who had come to boarding school. Right. <laughs> yes, and it was such that every dormitory has what we call an auntie. Uh, so there was one um, um, person to, a, um, one lady to a, a dormitory. So those were our aunties. And so we had um, upper girls and lower girls. So um, one class one to class three was lower girls. And then if you were in lower girls and you're in class three, you help the auntie to wash the class one and two's clothes. Yes, and then if you're in class three and you, you look a bit matured, you go to upper girls. So some class three students went to upper girls, and then um, they had the others mentor them. It was quite an interesting moment, because at that time also, my, my dad was away, my mom was trading between Liberia and Ghana, and so we had to be in the boarding school. And I'll say that, I mean, going on, 
um, well, the, the, the difficult moments was when your parents didn't come and visit you and your food was finished and you weren't hungry <laughs> because the dining hall food wasn't enough. Yeah. Yes, but going on to secondary school, um, I think that it really built me up. It built me up because when I, I remember when I went to Form 1 in Achimota School, House 11, and people's other class one uh, classmates, they had come, parents had brought them and then they were crying because they didn't want their parents to leave. And I was just lying quietly on my bed, just shaking my legs and just looking at them and smiling. And I remember somebody who had just come in form two uh, through the day, she came to me feeling very sorry for me. She offered me biscuits and I just laughed in my head and I said, you don't know who you are dealing with. <laughs> because for me, I was fine. I wasn't lying quietly because I, well, it was my first experience, but it built me up. It helped me to be smart. I mean, because in the in Achimata Prime, you have to get a bath quickly, 5 a.m., the bell is rang, and all. So it made me disciplined and um, made me quite focused also, and also to work smart. So, and I've carried that on, I, I especially, for example, I'm not the type who go in the bathroom and spend one hour there, mm -hmm. five minutes and I'm out, because that is the kind of training that we had. So yes, it, 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 shaped, it shaped my life very much, mm. yes. So would you recommend that for everybody? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, <laughs> everybody is different, and the world is changing now. I don't know, I'm still, Achimata Primary is still there, people still go, um, yes, so it depends on, I think these days we also show our children a lot, so mm -hmm. we don't allow them to grow and to harden up. So if you, mm -hmm. even now, if you take your uh, child to the boarding school, it's as if it's a punishment. And even sometimes you say, if you don't behave well, I'll take you to primary school, as if it's a boarding school, as if it's, it's a threat, as if yeah, some kind of punishment to go there. But yeah, there are people who are still going. In fact, there are people who are younger. There are some private institutions where three years they're in boarding school. Yes. Yes, in Ghana. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> in Ghana. So there are people that mo uh, I, I saw the school where most of the parents are abroad, so they leave their children, oh and then when it's holidays, they come yeah. for them. Yes, so some are that young. Wow. Yes, yeah. Th but th once the, the children are being taken care of, mm -hmm. they are being provided for, uh, etc. I think that it's not a bad idea. It's just that some children may be traumatized if you don't handle it well. Handle it well. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, for mm -hmm. me, I'm thinking that maybe if. If the child goes through that all the way to secondary school, the parents might be, the parents might feel like strangers. Oh, you you still go home on holidays, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's because perhaps you've become used to staying at home, class one up to JHS three. Uh, Imagine if that was not the case, and you're going to boarding school in form one. That. Because we used to go to boarding uh, boarding school form one yeah. most time, well, most of us, yes. So. It will just be the six years that the child is, is, okay, is at home. That would be yeah. the major yes, so yes, okay. yeah. But it's because now you spend the extra three years in uh, GHS. Yes, yes. 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 so you just go years. just for three years. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, quite interesting. And um, another question comes to mind, but I guess this one is more geared towards maybe how you handle it as parents or something. But how do you deal with conflict? Okay, this could not, it doesn't have to be just family level, but even in your workplaces, I'm working in teams, working with people, conflicts come up every now and then, people not agreeing to something, someone feeling some way about something. So how do you approach dealing with conflicts? Back to the teams. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, I think Margaret is an expert in conflicts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she <laughs> Margaret is an expert in conflict resolution. But um, coming back to family, I'll go back to the same word that I said I use with my team in the office. Fita. Is it fatal? For instance, just before we came, we had just uh, gotten somebody to assist us with mowing the compound and the mower was outside and it of course it's, it's been drizzling the whole day um it, water had gone on the mower so i needed to put it in the sun a bit so i said oh let me just pack this mower from the rain and margaret came and said oh let it dry a little bit more then i asked myself if i leave it here is it fatal Will it cause a problem? Why should this small thing create an issue? I said, no, that's okay. So I left it in the sun. After about 30 minutes, it started drizzling again. 
So I just said, Margaret, it's it's drizzling, so I want to pack this. She said, Go ahead, you can pack it. Something that could have just degenerated into so a serious I'm conflict <laughs> had been resolved because I told myself it's not fatal to leave this thing. It was a mower. To leave the mower out there in the sun to dry for a few minutes shouldn't create tension between us. So one of the ways, I'm using this as, as an example, one of the ways in resolving conflicts is to ask yourself, what is the worst thing that can happen? What's the big deal about this? And then you look at it. Um, however, when there are serious conflicts, I'll go back to my s issues again. We discuss, we pray, we plan, and then we leave the rest to God. I don't know if Dr. Margaret wants to add anything. To so, <laughs> okay. okay. Cool. Let's, let, let me take Let's us back, back a bit. So. Gr growing up, um, did you have foresight of where you guys would be now? Like maybe a general idea or general direction. Did you have in mind that you wanted to be working the spaces you guys are working? How did how was that journey like? Because most people connect the dots looking back, but looking forward is kind of like. It's better when you finish university fresh and it's like you're aimless in life now for a lot of people. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, growing up, I <laughs> didn't see myself here. But one thing that worked well for me is the fact that everything that happened built and contributed to me being where I am. I was very fortunate to come from a Christian home. I say very fortunate because not everybody gets it that way. The One of the things that I learned in my Christian home was to be able to live with different groups of people, mainly because I had different denominations in my home. My dad is an Anglican, was an Anglican. He's dead, uh, may he still rest in peace. My dad was an Anglican and a staunch Anglican as such. My mom was a, was a seven day Adventist. Um, so I learned to live with different denominations. And then I grew up, I became a charismatic Christian. And I married somebody who was a Methodist, <laughs> Margaret, <laughs> and also a staunch Methodist. And when I was doing my national service, I was looking for a church around. I didn't get any church around. The church that I got was an Assemblies of God church. So I also grew up in yeah, an yeah, Assemblies yeah. of God <laughs> church. And then when I came yeah, to yeah. campus, I joined AGCM, that's Assemblies of God uh, campus ministry. Yeah. And my wife was Methodist, Presby. So growing up in terms of my Christian background, even though I was fortunate to have a Christian background, I got a mix of denominations among, so it made me quite liberal. Christ is the center of Christianity. Denominations are man-made just because of certain um, reasons. So that incident, in terms of my home background, built me up in Christ, and I'm very fortunate for that. I got born again in secondary school during SU days. That also built me up. And one thing that had helped me as I grew up, uh, even though I didn't see myself where I am now, was the fact that through it all, I try to identify with Christ. So once I identify with Christ, identify with a Christian group, it gave me some form of um, check on my life. Um, and because of that check, I always, like I say, will plan, will pray, and leave the rest to God. Sometimes I wanted something really, really, really badly. It doesn't work. I look back and I say, God knew why he didn't give me that thing. All because I plan, I pray, and I leave the rest to God. And that's what has kept me through and through. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, don't, I didn't think I'll find myself where I am now. That was not, my dream was not to be a lecturer or a teacher. Um, growing up, it was the usual, I want to be a, an air hostess. <laughs> we used to say that I want to be a bank manager. Right now, right now what's the usual for women? Oh, well, f from where I am coming from, I don't know if it's different from others, but yeah. 
medical doctor, lawyer, lawyer, lawyer. No, it was none of those for me. It was uh, I yeah, want to be an air hostess. Travel around the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's what I wanted to do. I don't know what happened to that one, <laughs> but um, when I was uh, then I wanted to, I then I went to do psychology. But going to University of Ghana, I wanted to do nursing. I really wanted to do nursing, but I didn't get the grace to do nursing. I didn't do science. Well, science was not a requirement, but perhaps if I had done science, that would have pushed me, but I didn't get what I wanted, so they offered me psychology. And um, they offered me psychology, and I, I enjoyed it. So I was like, for me, I thought I was going to read people's minds, but yeah. I got <laughs> in and I realized, no, it's a study of, for the same yeah, yeah. I, it's actually the study of human behavior yeah. and mental processes. So it's not reading of minds. Yeah. And I enjoyed it. So during my first degree, I said, when I finish, I'll join the military. Yes. I don't even know what happened to that one <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> again. But um, I remember when I was doing my master's, I wanted to collect data with the military and on um, post, um, post-traumatic stress disorder among the, 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 the military men who had gone to the, for the Ecomoc uh, mission at Liberia. Oh. That's why I wanted to do my research on that. But unfortunately, I didn't because the commander at that time said, oh, we can even take you to Liberia and um, have you observe the men there. But then when you finish and you write your report, we have to see it before and vet it before you can have your thesis I mean, presented. And I said, no. I'm not going to do research and then I bring it and you say it doesn't suit you so I have you can't publish this or you can't publish that so that was it but I think when I did teaching I enjoyed being a teaching assistant I really enjoyed it. they used to tell us that tutorials is not a second lecture but I'll go and prepare notes and I'll go and teach so that is I think that's why I developed the interest from and then I was asked to, yes, I wanted to go and teach. I always say, but I hadn't made the effort. I hadn't applied or anything. But by God's divine intervention, I told you how I got there. I was called to go and teach. And that is how I found myself. And um, I can't see myself doing anything else. Yes, if you put me somewhere else, I can work. But I enjoy teaching. I enjoy the fact that I interact with the students and I can impact their lives. For me... It's, that's that's the, what I find rewarding. I mean, the students come very young, very innocent. You're teaching all right, but you chip in here and there. You um, give a bit of pep talk, advise them, because I have children their age. And so for me, I find that very fulfilling. I used to teach second years and third years, and then over the last couple of years, more of masters and then final year level 400 students. But I felt there was something missing. Although it meant my workload had reduced because I had fewer students, I felt like I still missed teaching the younger ones. And so this academic year, I punished myself. I'll put that away by <laughs> going to teach level 200. And the first time I started teaching first years, I said, what have I done to myself? I could have stuck with my small yeah, group. <laughs> yes, but I mean, we are almost at the end of the semester, and I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. I have, I have a I teach a course where the class is split into three, but I have a lot more people coming into my class because they say they understand when they come. Mm -hmm. So for me, and just talking to them, advising them, and over the years, I've been able to mentor people. I meet people in town and they're like, oh, I really like your course. I really like the way you were. I wanted to be like you. So I'm, I'm glad God put me in this position, even though that is not what I started with. But um, I'm enjoying it, and um, mm -hmm. I'll continue to do the best that I can mm -hmm. there. So that means small gap, and you'd have ended up in, as a military nurse. I'm <laughs> telling you, <laughs> the military psychologist. Yes, yes, yes. 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 In Liberia, I'm moving around. I'm telling yeah. you, I'm telling you. God is good. We have you here. So. <laughs> so yeah, I, I naturally uh, love mathematics. Actually, I hated reading. That makes um, so I look at my son, <laughs> and then uh, when <laughs> we were, he was a little younger, you tell him to go and read, he will never go and read. So when you force him, he'll go and take a football book, and he said he's reading. He hated reading. So I could see myself in him, mm -hmm. because I didn't like reading. I love mathematics. And for my last daughter, 
to get an A star in A level mathematics. I said, wow, this girl followed the dad. I was really good at mathematics and I really love maths. And I love working with numbers, numbers, numbers. And I'm not surprised that I'm still I'm doing budget work now. That's why I said God is an interesting God. He 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 weaves your path plan pray and let just leave the rest <laughs> just leave the rest to god yeah so i found myself dealing with numbers and i looked back i said i really love numbers and i love to work with numbers however i noticed i had a weakness in reading so during my a-level national service one of the things that kept me was i i found i told you about the agcm the assemblies of yeah, god's god. church yeah, yeah. I was doing my A-level national service. That was in uh, 92 at Gomwa in Prumim. I had to travel all the way to Gomwa and Kamu to find a church. And that was the Assemblies of God Church, which was about, for those who know, Ankamu is uh, uh, like a Palm Junction. Gomwa and Kamu is a Palm Junction. And I was at Gomwa and Prumim. So um, in terms of distance, let's say I was on four, 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 four to five miles from, uh, fr from the village. The first time I saw the Osofu, Osofu's are good. <laughs> so I, I, he became my friend. And then I told him, oh, can you give me something to read? So he gave me two Christian literature. And I wanted to impress that guy. So I had to read it well. And the following week, I went to church. I told him I finished it. Then he gave me another book. Had it not been for that period, I would have to I would have said I hated reading. So even though I was good at numbers, just that transition and just for me to prove to yourself that I can read. And that guy was pushing me with a lot of books, not knowing he was training me for me to help him in the church and all those things. So in the end, with my math background, I also had a little bit of uh, ability to read and some report skills, etc. And through divine intervention, I find myself where I am. So I think God weaves and works in mysterious ways. If you plan, you pray, and then you leave the rest. <laughs> you leave the rest. What, <laughs> what did you want to be growing up? What did you have in, in mind? In fact, I didn't know what I wanted. But when I was going to the university, I was also good at art drawing art so i wanted to be an architect initially um and then around um 92 thereabout with the advent of computers and with my interest in mathematics legon started a course called mathematical science so yeah so then i applied into that mathematical science we were the first group to use uh, the, that system because they were doing a system they were calling bubra but we were using the semester system. So 92, we were the first group to do the uh, semester yeah. system at uh, Legon. So we went into the mathematical science cohort, mainly because of my interest in mathematics. So in mathematical science, I had to do computer science, statistics. I did physics. Um, those were my initial uh, uh, courses. But gradually, I veered into computer science and mathematics. And then finally, I decided to graduate with computer science and statistics, mainly because maths and stats, I didn't see much of a serious difference in it. So originally, I wanted to go to do architecture, and I landed in a mathematical line where I came up with my first degree in computer science and then statistics. And then I worked as a research officer, applying most of my statistical skills. Along the line, I'm shifted into IT, shifted into project management, and I'm doing budgeting. <laughs> Interesting. It's, it's never like a clear cut path, yeah. but as you take it one day at a time, like you said, plan, pray, and then leaving the rest to God, you find your way through. Architect and nurse. I, I know. Sorry, But actually, um, from the profile, you were pretty athletic. So I was actually going to ask, like, why didn't you consider well, Olympics? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe Olympics or pursuing a career in that part. Was it because it's in Ghana or like? Um, I don't think I was at that level, that national level. Um, so I I mentioned that I did sports when I was in house eleven. Yeah. I was doing um four by hundred, two hundred, four hundred, and I mainly eight hundred thousand five hundred. Yes, but and then I went to Shredu Secondary, I did sports as well. 
and I did a bit of sports in Volta Hall. But I think in the university, the sports was not as serious as it is now. Oh. Maybe if it was, maybe I would have taken it. But um, I think what I didn't like was I had too much anxiety when I had to um, okay. uh, compete in an event. Too much anxiety, too much heartbeat and all of that. Mm. So I think that also didn't help. But when I did it, I was good at it. But I think the university, the sports wasn't se that serious. I don't mm. think I was really up there to uh, mm. go on the national. Yeah. Oh, but I enjoyed okay. it whilst it lasted. Oh, yes. Okay. okay. So, um, so from everything you said, especially about how your career paths uh, progressed and everything, it seems like the most important thing is, especially from Dr. Alexis's submission, discovering what you are good at is like always key as well. Um, I'm, as, I'm, I'm just reiterating because I think growing up, like he was saying, it's it's usually the, the things like, okay, what do I want to do? Maybe you see a nicely dressed lawyer, like, oh, I like the way she looks, I want to be a lawyer. Or you go ahead and then maybe watch maybe something Some on TV, a series <laughs> like Grace Anatomy or something, you went, oh, I want to be a doctor, you know. So it's like, how do you finally determine what you want to be? But I think one point I have taken is, what are you good at? Uh, and then how can you make maybe a career out of that is also one way mm. to look at it. The uncertainty is high. And then mm -hmm. even now more than ever, there's, there are more variables, there mm. are more factors. True. You, you can pick, you can pick a lecturer's a lecture series and follow a course online almost for free on YouTube. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The options are that many. Mini. So it's, it's usually the um, analysis paralysis or choice paralysis is a lot growing up now, especially mm -hmm. ever more. Mm -hmm. And most of the people we've, we've had these discussions with, mm -hmm. where they started, what they had in mind, and where they are, uh, <laughs> they almost never match. Really, really did it match. And you guys have been out of the country, and, mm. and, and opportunities came. He had to read to his pastor. No, no, he was developing a muscle that he had he had written off. Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If that mm -hmm. if that scenario didn't come, and if he didn't take it up as a challenge, he would have been a totally different person. You know what I'm saying? Maybe they would have given him only maths, not budget because he has to tell the story attached to the to, <laughs> to the math so i find that very interesting mm -hmm. now and um, begs the question how did you guys meet and how did you guys start this <laughs> before i answer that i no just problem. want to add something to what she said about the fact that these days there are so many choices so many options um i just want to say this to the younger ones um with my children for example they were not sure what they wanted to do. Of course, Kweku always wanted computer science. It, it's, it's interesting, but the twins, Kweku is doing computer science, math, and Ikea is doing psychology. <laughs> um, interesting. Oh, yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Ikea didn't know what she wanted to do. Okay. She was so confused. But always what I told them is just work hard and get the good grades. And then whatever you want to do, you can apply for it. I, 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 only if it's not science and you did not do science. Yes, so it's always, I always tell those who, the younger ones who are not sure what they want to do, I say just work hard and get the good grades and then you can decide. And I'll ask, um, do you have any interest in anything? Any little interest you have, you can, you can um, uh, harness that. So Equia wanted to do psychology. Now she wasn't sure that because I was doing psychology, that's why she wanted to do psychology. So she did some internship at um, a preschool uh, helping out there and um, after a couple of days being there she said now nah. she said she wants to be a developmental psychologist or a child psychologist uh, I think she wants to be a child psychologist but she said now nah, she's certain that she wants to do psychology because that is what she loves to do so sometimes and with Abana also it's the same thing she didn't know what she wanted she wanted to do and um, unfortunately or unfortunately for her she's good at every subject that she lays her hands on so it makes it more difficult and I always used to tease her that if you're only good in two subjects, you would know what you want to do. <laughs> yes, but now she's, she's going to start investing in September. She's going to do regional and urban development. But every day I go home, mommy, I want to be a Formula One driver. Mommy, I want to be a YouTuber. 
Mommy, I want to be an actress. I've now decided I want to be a producer. And then I'll say, okay, you list all of them. Okay, today you said that you list all of them. When you finish, we'll talk about it. But sometimes they need direction. Mm -hmm. They really need direction because, like you said, there's so many things out there yeah. and they get so confused. So it's important that we encourage them. If they don't know what to do, they should just work hard and excel. And when they get to the point where they decide that this is what I want to do, they have all the good grades, etc. And then they can move. Before you come in to the marriage thing, I would like to add one thing is know your interest. Just like uh, you said, what you are good at. Um, and enjoy doing what you are good at. You can definitely get a profession out of it. I use myself as an example. I love working with figures, numbers, and I continued working with figures and numbers <laughs> all along my career, and I'm now working with figures <laughs> and numbers. <laughs> and I enjoy it. The stress enjoy. is a lot at work, but I enjoy it because I enjoy working with the figures and the numbers and i plan i pray and i leave the rest to god both feet are in on feet what are you going to say something again no, so i wanted to you ask how did we meet yes okay that's an interesting one so um alex mentioned that he did his service national service at goma and um in the um, central region i was posted to i think the western region but the usual, when they post you outside Accra, you don't want to go. So I tried hard, but I couldn't change it. But I managed, my father managed to change it to Central Region for me, because I come from the Central Region. And then they posted me to a village called Guman Kransa. And um, also in the Central Region. And I was in a district that, my school was in the same district as Alexis District. So this is A-level, uh, after A-level national service. Okay. Yes, so one day we had um, inter-school um, sports competition. So when I got, we went to his school at Goman Pumim. So when I got there, then I was told that, oh, there's a national, another national service person there. So I met him for the first time. I still remember what I was wearing. I was in a green uh, tie and dye shorts and top. I like the way Alex is smiling. I, <laughs> I saw him. He introduced himself. We introduced ourselves. And I gave him a hug. For whatever reason, I don't know. That time you didn't but know him. I didn't you know him. Fresh. I didn't know him. <laughs> But I gave him a hug, and that was it. And then we met again when it was National Service Week, and then we went to Akosumbo. There was a trip to, um, an excursion to Akosumbo, and then we met. And then um, the last was when, at the end of the National Service, um, they had a party, they usually have a party. And I was part of those who were, who were doing the cooking at that time. So he also came, and then he told me he was at Legon, and... Um, I think he, no, that was after that. So he came for that as well. Then I think we lost, that was it. Then when I went to Impumim to visit him, he had left. They said he, his dad had sent for him that school had reopened, so he should come and prepare for school at Legon. Then one day, well, I had to better one of my, my economics. I had to better economics. So I waited one year and we sat economics. So one day at the Achimata village, the, the old taxi rang. I was walking along there when I saw a taxi pass by. It stopped, and then somebody got out, and that was Alex. Yes, he was in a blue long sleeve shirt. I remember that one. Apparently, they were <laughs> going for um, speech there at Accra Academy. Okay. So he saw me, and then he gave me his um, address on Legon campus, his room number. And I said, oh, I've applied to Legon, so I'm hoping to come back, I mean, That's the following yeah. year, yes. And so I gained admission. So I think he also went to those days, they'll, pay, they'll paste the admission list on the notice board. So he went to look on the list and he saw my name. So he knew I was coming. And because I had his address and I knew he was in age 24 in Commonwealth Hall, I went to look for him. And then we carried on. So we, our friendship continued from there. We were very good friends, very, very close friends. In fact, people, our friends thought we were dating, but we were yeah, not. And we couldn't you. convince anyone. I even took a bet with somebody, $100. He <laughs> so said, I'll marry Alex. I said, I'll marry Alex. Oh. Because he's not my, we are just friends. You have to pay up. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you. No, actually, the day we got married, somebody gave me $100 to pay. Oh. <laughs> oh. Ah, so they, ah, so a, a number of people knew the bet. Yes, they knew oh, okay. the bet, yeah. yes. I think you should pay $100 every year. <laughs> Yes, so yes, we became friends on campus and we we're very close. 
very close friends. Even had a problem, Mr. Alex, I talk about to, to, to tell. And then as he mentioned, he did his national service on campus. So when I was in my final year, he was doing his national service and he was on, in, still in Commonwealth Hall. And um, we continued our friendship we were friends for about seven years. Uh -huh. And then he, in fact, at a point in time, one day he told me that, um, should I say? <laughs> <laughs> so one day he says he wants to say something to me. And usually we would take a walk around campus. Sometimes we would sit somewhere in front of Water Hall till 3 a.m. just chatting. What a friend. <laughs> yes, just chatting. And then he said, oh, and we've been friends for a while, and he, he, he wants to make a move, but he doesn't feel like, I mean, we should, he should have a relationship with me. So if I meet someone and I like the person, I can go ahead. And um, that strengthened our, uh, strengthened our bond. Oh. Yes, knowing that we are just friends, nobody wants anything from the other person, really made our relationship even stronger. So we were friends, we, I finished campus, I was doing my service, and he started working at PPAG. And then um, one day he went on a, a, on a trek in the Volta region. And then before he came, he called me that, oh, he wanted to come and take me out. So that day, I got ready, I did, had my hair done, my best boots. <laughs> and then when he came, I was in Tessa then. Where he sat, I could see where he was sitting, and he was in a t-shirt, and here I was in my evening wear. <laughs> I'm like, this guy, he's come to take me <laughs> out. <laughs> he's wearing a t-shirt. So I had to tone down my dressing, so and went I went back. to wear, yes, so I just, I, I had, a, I changed my top, so that uh, at least I'll tone down, uh, yes. But and did so, he see the dress before? No, he didn't, okay. but I could see from the window, the window when, yeah, where he was where sitting he was in the sitting. Okay. Uh, family area, yes. So... We, he took me out to, it used to be Gloryland Hotel, I don't know if it's still there, at Odoko. And um, we had a meal I'm and he said, do my research. <laughs> 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 and he said, I want us to get serious. And I said, what do you mean by you want us to get serious? That's a typical Hachimotan person. What do you mean by you want us to get serious? <laughs> and um, that, that, that was, he said, oh, we've been friends for a while and he wants us to be in a relationship. So I said, the usual, think about it. Uh, it didn't take me long. <laughs> <laughs> One day, I just got up and I went to, he was staying at South Lagoon, and I said, well, but when I went that day, he wasn't there. I waited for him, he came, and I said, well, uh, I think I really like you, and I think that um, we can make, we can get serious. Uh -huh. So from then, uh, I think two years after we got married, because we had been friends, and yeah, it didn't take long for us to but, yeah. decide that we wanted to settle down. So... That was in 1998 when I was doing my national service. And then in 2000, December, we got married. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Alex's version of this. Yes. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> she, she said it all, but just for some clarification, you were talking about national service. We were doing two different national services. Okay. There's one national service after A level and one national service after okay. university. So as she was talking about national service for. Um, the youth who do not know, yeah. they'll get confused. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So, A level. A level, we did national service. My yeah. A level national service was what I did in the central region, Gomua uh, area. Yeah. That is where I met my same district. But when I finished university, I also did my second national service on Legon oh, campus. Yeah. Okay. And I was still in Commonwealth. Okay. So, I, I worked one year national service on Legon campus at the data processing okay. center. Okay. And I did my A-level national service in the central region. But I met Margaret at my A-level national yeah. service yeah. Uh, in the central region. And we were friends all along till my university national, national service <laughs> at the University of Ghana Data Processing Center, where I did my second. Nice. So we were doing two. Yeah, I just, just that clarification. Because when she mentioned national yeah. service, yeah. national yeah. service, yeah. You, yeah. Might, you might get, yeah, uh, yeah you might get confused. Yeah. And she did her. University National Service as a TA yeah. at the university. But by that time, you were out of Legon. That I was out of Legon. And even also. had done with your national service. I had done with my national service, yeah. Okay. yeah. So after my okay. university national service, I got employed at Plant Parenthood Association as a research uh, officer. That's why I applied my maths and my statistics. And it was during one of uh, my numerous tricks because with my work at the Planned Parenthood, I used to trek a lot. Sometimes about three months I hadn't slept on my bed. We were moving wow. from community to community, hotel to hotel, doing uh, community service, 
so I roamed the whole country. Yeah, so it was on one of my treks that I I, I had a feeling that you I should come, come and, home, good and, good. Uh, and then uh, <laughs> take her out for lunch. And for oh. someone who has been working in the village with a t-shirt and uh, <laughs> I anyway, okay, yeah, now, okay, right, you understand. Now it makes sense. Now it, makes, <laughs> it wasn't anything personal. Yes, no, well, yes, yeah, yeah you've you been moving. Yeah, I get you. I get you, yeah. Oh, interesting. Uh, but, mm-hmm. Okay, sorry. Um, you go ahead. <laughs> oh, I've even forgotten what I was going to say. Um, okay, what's your question? Okay, I, I was going to say that one of the biggest things for young people who are yet to get married today is in choosing a partner. Uh-huh. So, I, I, so I wanted to ask, like, we are not maybe directly asking you what did you see in him that yeah, he is, but, but like, generally. generally, what would you say are the most important things that um they used to look out for in a partner you know for a relationship it was the exact same question I was oh, ask. Okay. um i think being a christian the first thing i would look out for is uh, someone who is christian so i wanted somebody who um shared the same faith as i did and who walked the same walk as i walked and um i found that in alex I, in fact, he was more just than me <laughs> because he's actually the the UCF president in Commonwealth Hall. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. Okay. So very it was very, very, <laughs> very, very. So it was very easy for me. It was a very easy for us to build our relationship because we shared the same faith. So I would say because in a marriage without Christ, I mean, one person can be Christian and know Christ, but if the other person doesn't have that faith and doesn't have that buy-in it's difficult so the two of you two of you should share the faith you look for somebody who is a christian and um somebody who is caring i'll tell you when i was doing my when i was graduating my first degree when i was graduating i was in tesano and i was living with the okujetus and um yes 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 um and um Alex came in, I was ironing my dress, and then he came, and then he took the iron, and then he ironed it for me. And I remember mommy, Mrs. Okujetu, she called me and she said, he'll be a good man, grab him. <laughs> that is what she said. Interesting. Yes, <laughs> but recently we're talking about it. I mean, for a, a gentleman to come and offer to iron your dress for you, for her, it was something else. But one thing I noticed is that Alex, had, he has only one sister, and he really loved his sister. He cared so much about his sister. And his, when his mom was alive, it was the same. If you find a man like that, chances are he, he will care about you also. Amen. Yes. So <laughs> somebody who is, who is hardworking, somebody who is caring, see how he treats other ladies, especially his, his mom, his siblings, okay. his sisters, okay. and it, it will give you, if, if he doesn't respect them, then you should know that it can happen to you. But the first thing is the person should be a Christian because at the end of the day, I mean, being a Christian doesn't mean you won't have arguments. You have arguments, you have disagreements and everything. But if you have Christ at the center, you know that after all the conflicts, you can go on your knees and pray and pray together. No matter how angry you are, you can pray. So that is very important. And somebody who is caring, somebody who is hardworking, and somebody who, is, who, who stands by his word, not say one thing and then act in another way somebody who um, is trustworthy that's very important yeah i'm sure i let you add to it um some um some took care of my mom growing up okay yeah okay. even in his book my mom name it, my my mom and her siblings were mentioned I see. in some yeah so we, we know some very well okay so let me just give a little background um sana okujetu is um, Daddy's uh, Miss, Mr. Kujetu's daughter, daughter was yeah. my classmate in Achimota okay. School. Ah. Yes, so we're all in the same house together, right. and we became yeah. friends. Yeah. And um, during the holidays, I'll go there, spend a weekend, go Friday, leave on Sunday, and then Sunday became Monday, Monday became Tuesday, and I ended up living there. Okay. So from university, after I set from university, I lived there till. But, but I got married, really. Oh. Yes. So they are, I'm a daughter of the right. family. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. that's the background. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. yes. Margaret, Margaret has said it all. Um, the first. From the guy's perspective. From the guy's perspective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, 
And with the youth, I will always advise Christ is the center of our relationship. So once you're a Christian, you look for a Christian. Don't look at denomination. Like I said, denomination is man made. Christ is the center of our relationships. And so in choosing a partner, look for a Christian. And one of the things that had worked for us is communication. Um, we were friends and we could talk about virtually everything. Her challenges were my challenge. We discuss it. Even when I, those times we were friends, when I go and crash on a girl, I come and tell her, I've seen this girl, I was quite interested, and she would advise me. Because we were friends, we could talk about virtually everything. So communication is key. So I will advise, first, Christian should be, once you're a Christian, look out for a Christian, not a denomination. And people also can even fake Christianity, but communication will bring that thing out. And then have very good communication. You should be somebody you can talk to. No pretense. Be yourself. And then and then uh, be able to communicate. And these are some of the things that you can look out for. And then in addition to that, all what Margaret said, <laughs> it's, it's, it's fine. Yeah. So, yeah, and Christ being the center, someone who is caring, someone who is hardworking, mm-hmm. and someone who communicates well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. I see. Okay. Um, and Glory Land Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> okay, fair point. So, would you say that, especially the communication bit, because one follow up question I had in mind was, You've been married 22 years. Yes. So, like, that secret, right, that has definitely kept things together because you're living in the same space. Maybe even the the littlest of things may start to vex. I mean, some lawnmower somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe the toilet seat is up and it's supposed to be down and all of that. So I was going to ask, like, what if it, there's been one or two secrets that has, have helped to keep the marriage as well intact? Maybe apart from communication. <laughs> um, uh, well, I, in my training, I always identify three things that uh, you need to watch out for in a marriage. I say communication, sex, and then finances oh. are key in a relationship. And I like to say these three things have kept us together. We have very good communication. We talk on virtual everything. A very good sex life is also key. And then finally, one thing that you could also look out is finances. People have different thoughts about finances, but one of the things that had helped us, and for me as a guy, it's helped me, is that we keep joint accounts. So whether Maggie is in Saskatchewan or she's in US, if I withdraw or make any transaction from the accounts, she, she gets the alert, she's aware. And then when she also does it, I'm also aware. People have different thoughts. People agree, argue that you should keep your money separately, and it's worked for them perfectly. That is their choice. But for me, we've kept it together, and it's worked for us well. Perfectly, and I don't have a problem. If it didn't work for me, I don't recommend it. It's worked for me and it's working for me. And since we got married, we've kept joint accounts. All our accounts are joint. She has a let, I have a let, I have a let, she has a let. So it, there's no argument about finances. Like I said, communication is key, finances is key, sex is key. These are the three things that, on a particular survey that I read, lead to a lot of challenges in marriages. We are not perfect, like I told you earlier. We are working hard towards it. We have our faults, our mistakes, but we watch these three things and it's 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 helping, yeah. Okay, I think what I also add is, um, for me, I also think being friends is very, there are a lot of um, um, couples who are not friends. They, when they merely play roles. They just play a role as a husband's role and a wife's role, and that is it. They are not friends. And so they don't, communication, there's a problem with communication, or they don't communicate effectively, and also they don't share. Because we are friends, we share. There's everyth- I know everything about his work that he can share with me. Of course, there are some things that 
I mean, you may not be able to share everything, but I know everything, his work, um, uh, colleagues, etc. Um, I know I have one or two people at his workplace phone numbers that if I can't reach him, I can reach I them. Reach. And same with me. But we share everything. And so we talk. He also knows everything that goes on in my workplace, apart from, of course, because I do, I see clients, there are some things yeah, I cannot talk about, especially, yeah. yes, especially if there are people he knows. I mean, yeah, but we, we talk we share um it's not that everything is perfect we do have disagreements we do have misunderstandings but i always say that we've never had a misunderstanding where we've had to call in a third party or have someone settle it we get upset with each other at the end of the day we know that when we go to bed we have to sleep next to each other uh -huh. we have to hold each other when uh -huh. we go to bed uh -huh. so that is it whether you're angry or not, you end up in the same bed. So being friends for me, it's we are friends. We can joke. We can laugh. The kind of things that we... I always say if somebody puts a CCTV in a house just for one day, they'll have something to laugh about for a lifetime. <laughs> I mean, the silliest things, the uh, funniest things. We, we are friends. We are friends. We can joke around. Some couples can joke around. They can say certain things to yeah. their spouses without they getting offended. But we can joke around. And that has kept mm -hmm. us going. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. I think that's been very informative. I mean, the the research shows that um, the number one cause of divorce in America, I don't know how we're gonna start, but I think it might be the same. It's money fights and money problems. Uh. So yeah, so the communication and the financial, be on the same page of financial is a huge game changer. Because mm -hmm. I know people, I know adults who have their own personal account, their wife doesn't know, they have some land somewhere. I even know women who have some bank account in US, their husband in Ghana don't know. Because I'm because I'm a business analyst, so that kind of thing. So yeah, it's it's real and sometimes it's it's scary and discouraging. Yeah. Mm. It, it is. I remember once um I went to the bank to put in some money and it was quite an amount of money. And um the lady asked, so the lady at the uh, till said, oh, I see you have a joint account, a young lady, so how do you manage this? And she's like, I'm sorry I have to ask you this, it's not professional, but we're arguing over it on our platform. And um, so, and with our accounts, it's not both will sign, either or. Oh, okay. Yeah, but because we trust each other, I mean, I, I, I love him, I care about him, I won't want to do anything to hurt him. And it's the same for him with me. And so we trust each other enough to say that anybody can sign. I know he won't go and empty the coffers because I, tr I trust him and he trusts me. So he was just asking me and I said, well, I've been to couples fellowship meetings where they've talked about finances and people have talked about how their spouse will blow the money and mm -hmm. misuse the money. So like he said, it's different for everybody. If you don't have that understanding, um, you can decide to keep a joint account and in the end there may be issues. So know thyself. But for us, it's a word for us. And everything we do is in our joint name. Even if we go and buy furniture, it's in our joint. Everything is in our joint name. Uh, and it's, it's been like that, and it's worked for us. Yeah. So in as much as it's worked for us, like I said, there are different uh, schools of thought. I was at a seminar somewhere where the presenter, who was an Osofo, argued strongly against a joint account. Interesting. Because it worked for him. He has his separate accounts. But I also come from the fact that you trust me enough, I trust you enough, we lie on the same bed enough, <laughs> we bath <laughs> together. And you trust yeah. yourself so much, but you cannot share your money together. Well, everybody in there, it, it works for some people, it doesn't work. And for this one, it's not a prescription. Try it for yourself and see how, how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't prescribe but it, but me, it's worked for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It worked for me. It might be fatal for some It might be not fatal for some Yeah, it might be fatal for some yeah. So you need Everybody to, is different. So you need to observe the effects. Yeah, we were, we, were counseling, we were counseling a couple in UK, okay. and the woman said, what? You want me to have a joint account with this guy? It's, it won't work because of the perspective that they had. The lady was so hardworking, killing herself 
and working hard to take care of the family and the man was such a relaxed guy who didn't care about anything and you know if you've lived abroad you know that every hour counts yeah. so if the lady works hard and puts the money in the joint account yeah. this guy will just yes. use a credit card and just go and then <laughs> and then blow. and we were counseling them that it's worked for us and it sounded so strange to them that how can this be that you and your husband are having it's not possible it, no matter what you said you said this one there it won't work so my i'm not prescribing mm -hmm. but i'm just recommending but it works and i think it saves you a lot of hustle particularly for me yeah. as a as a young man <laughs> it saves me a lot of hustle <laughs> because you encounter situations where you want to dole out money but you realize that whatever you do there's a check so you are forced to discuss with your wife yeah. before you go ahead and do it so that means you, you, you guys cannot surprise each other. <laughs> oh, we are going to surprise ourselves. If you are going to buy something, you Oh, we money. surprise yeah. ourselves. We do it. We have our ways of We have our ways oh, of okay. surprising. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so even though it's a joint account, we are able to surprise ourselves. Okay, okay. I can cash enough and then... Use some <laughs> later. <laughs> <laughs> I get you. I get you. I get you. Right, yeah. um, Let me just add that it was something that our marriage counselors recommended for us. Okay. And it oh, worked for us. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I see. I mean, just to make a point, I mean, I find this particular aspect of the discussion quite interesting because I have, I don't know, I've been very, I don't know. On having a, yeah, I, I, th I guess you could say that when it comes to having a joint account, because in my mind, it's like, so every little expenditure, like, you have to tell. But I think that, I, like you, I guess you said, it's, it's built trust and it's, it's, it lets you guys know that there's nothing to hide, you know. Yeah. So that said, I think um, I, I think it's also the personality, you <laughs> because if, if, the the, the if the person is the person is um, if the person is painful or the person mm. is somebody who yeah. if somebody comes True. and puts a mobile face, they are dishing out money. <laughs> you have to be very strategic. You have to be very strategic about uh, how to, yeah, about have to it, limit so. that kind of thing. So. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's what I was sense. saying. Um, we went for a couple's fellowship uh, yeah. program once, and some a couple, one was complaining that the guy comes and says, oh, if we have a business plan, and then yeah. uh, it always doesn't, um, nothing comes mm. out, out, mm. out of yeah, the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But one thing also is that we yeah. plan, we, we plan together, so it's easier. Okay. Um, now, I think it's a long time since we did that, but that was when we I mean, growing up together or i mean when we started we have we carry in um, um um costs expenses. so like expenses like electricity whatever and then we say okay then this that we want to buy maybe new furniture so those were the one big projects. so okay. yes and because okay. we talk also i can say oh this onion seller i want to give some money to the person so if we get some money i want to give money to the person so because we talk he knows so when it's when there's money and I'll say, Oh, do you remember this person? I said and she said, Oh yes, I said, Oh, I want to and then I we do it. So because we talk that also helps. Yeah. I, I pray for such such a situation. Such a <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, okay. but like you rightly said, it it depends on the and you said this too, the, it depends, it depends on, on the person you are with yeah, and what would work for yeah. you. So you have so. to take it accordingly. Oh nice. Um so there's a question I ask my clients, right, the successful ones. How do you guys manage stress? <laughs> there are a lot of moving partners. <laughs> you plan and you are able to execute, but how do you manage stress? Um, if you ask me, uh, I teach on stress, so I can list a lot of things that you can uh, do to manage stress. But personally, it depends on the stressor. And it depends on the stressful situation that I'm encountering. That will determine how I'll deal with it. But um, over the last a couple of months now, maybe starting sometime this year or the year before, I've learned just to relax. I'm somebody who, I'm a bit of a perfect perfectionist. I want to get things right. It makes two of us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so i always want to get things right although sometimes i don't do well with uh, uh, um, what do you call it uh, deadlines mm. yes but i like to uh, do things right i like to get things right and when i have a lot to do then i i get bogged down i get stressed so lately what i have been doing is i just say i just tell myself to relax 
and um, that's one of the, the, the um, techniques that we use. You know, when the mind is relaxed, the body is relaxed. When the mind is not relaxed, the body is not relaxed. So one of the things we teach is just tell yourself, relax, relax, and then your mind relaxes, the body relax. So I do it to myself. I just tell myself, relax, there's a lot to do. So which one can you do first? Which one um, is, has the closest deadline? And which one can you put, I mean, at the back bench till you finish the others? And it's worked for me. But like I said, what is the stressor? And you know what stress is? You face a situation and then you weigh the resources that you have. If you think you have enough resources to deal with the situation, you don't experience stress. Yeah. If you have little resources to deal with it, you experience some amount of stress. But if you have no resources to deal with it, then high levels of stress. <laughs> the Ghana economy and people. <laughs> <laughs> people's bank accounts. Yes, yes. So what, uh, what is the situation? What can you do? Sometimes you may have to fall on people, social support. Sometimes it's money issues. Can you borrow money? Can you go to credit union and take a loan? Whatever. But you need to take the situation rather than, you know, it's like holding a string of beads, right? And then you drop it. Let's say you're stringing beads. And mm -hmm. then you leave it and it drops and then it just scatters awesome, all over. Yeah. And then it's going under the chair. You're trying to pick up. You wouldn't know which one to pick up first. Mm -hmm. You see, and sometimes when you are, when you, you are, there's a lot on your plates and you are stressed, that's what happens. So in the end, you are trying to pick, but then you are not actually making headway as to everything that has scattered on the floor. So you need to pause and then take one at a time. Know that you can't collect all of it in one moment. So which one can you deal with? And lately, that's what I've been doing, especially, I mean, uh, taking up an administrative role and having a lot to do. I try to just take, I say, I say, what's the worst thing that can happen? And then I just take it one, I just tell myself, just relax and take it one at a time. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, what about Dr. Ling? Maybe you may have a slide. Yeah, the, the, no, 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 no different approach, the same approach. Um, if the stress is such that I can exit the situation, I exit, I pause. I think through, I pray, and I leave the rest to God. Nice. <laughs> 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 okay, okay. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for that. I think I think the stress bit. Um, it's. <sighs> I find myself there a lot, so I think it's been very helpful, especially when you said, "Tell your mind to relax. Just pause for a moment. Tell your mind to relax, and then it kind of translates into your body." I think it's something I want to for, take. For me, what gives me. Yeah. Sorry, for me, what gives me stress more than usual, which people don't tend to understand is, for me, if if nothing's happening, that's when I start getting, I guess, start getting stressed because my brain starts to tell me that you've probably forgotten something that has to happen. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it's unusual that you have this amount of, of space. So then I start stressing about this thing. And then later, something usually reminds me that, yes, you forgot this thing or stuff like that. So. It's, it's kind of it's difficult for me to relax. It's difficult for me. I get uncomfortable when I'm doing nothing, really, okay. than when I'm this kind of thing. Do you so. want me to put you on the couch for therapy? <laughs> <laughs> I, I will sign up. But honestly, I will sign yeah. up. You, you talked about, you, you, you mentioned that when you plan, you have to plan on paper. I think Alex mentioned, yeah. and also said, yeah. yeah. So maybe you could use that because if you're searching through your mind to see if you've forgotten about something, if you have things written down, then you should be able to pick it up and run through and see what am I missing. I can understand if you are sitting there and there's nothing going on, you think it means that your adrenaline is always running. Yeah. Yes. Most for the most for the, yeah. Yes. So maybe I don't know how much you put on paper. I but if you're a lot. a lot. So so there should be something that you should pick and say, Okay, I'm going through this and then if I've written everything down, then I should be able to check the ones that I've done and the ones that I've not done. I'm, I'm thinking more in, part, in terms of like opportunities. Like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm self-employed. Okay, so that kind of thing. So if, if let's say the client numbers, because of the economy, are, are reducing and stuff like that. So basically, yeah, okay. it's it's more it's more in the lines of um, the opportunity cost. Is there something I'm supposed to do? Be doing that, having done towards the foreseeable future. Okay, no, not necessarily that okay. I've missed something on my timetable. Oh, okay, sorry. All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Nice. Um. So I want to 
steer the conversation off just a little bit and for us to go into um, bringing in church life. Okay. So um, I see that we are both very active in that regard, um, counselors and then I think lay readers. Yeah. And first and foremost, I think one thing that is there is that oh, I'm so busy with, I have kids, I am raising them, I, I have work as well and all of that. How do I then give time to church as well and i just wanted you to touch a bit on it like what has it been for you that you're able to serve in church as well despite your very busy schedules so you would like to go first. well in in terms of church i am or rather say i don't find time i have to make time <laughs> everybody's busy <laughs> so you have to make time um, I'm very fortunate once again because my office is close to the church. And when the Ghana priest, it got to a time I wasn't coming. I always find myself busy in the office. But I tell myself I have to be here. Days that I tell myself I have to be there, surprisingly, once again, yeah. the God that you don't understand mm -hmm. will make a way <laughs> such that I'm here. So I think instead of saying that you don't find time, you have to make time. And it's working for me. And I'm praying, like I said, still work in progress, mm -hmm. <laughs> that God will help me to make more time for the things of God. Um, we also try to make time for couples. So anytime we have a couples fellowship, a couples meeting, we are very busy. Once I'm in Accra, I have to make time and it works out. There was a time I was at my usual workshop at Kofodia, and Margaret said, I want to be in church, contemporary service, 8.30. I had the luxury of relaxing in my hotel room till the next, till two o'clock, and I'll leave and come to Accra. I said, no way. I woke up early morning, forget breakfast, forget everything. I moved my car, I came to Accra, and by 8.30, I was here in church. And people who were even five minutes away were late. So the issue is you have to make time. You can't find time. You have to make time for church. So how do we do it? It's just a commitment. Once you make time for it, you'll be able to make it. I would like to confess, well, I think I'm not doing too good in that light. But once I purpose in my heart, the Lord makes a way and we're able to support in the church. And one thing is, you come in, it's a dual, like a double-edged sword. You receive and you also give. And you become better by receiving as well as giving. It's not always that you come to church, you come and receive from the pastor that's <laughs> giving you. You also, in your own small way, the little that you can give out, you have to do it. So let's make time. Even though what we are doing, we think it's not enough. It's a purpose that you have to purpose in your heart to do it. So. I just have to purpose and anytime I purpose, the Lord makes a way. So my recommendation is purpose in your heart that if you want to sacrifice and serve and put in and contribute to the work of the church, you'll be able to do that once you purpose in your heart, the Lord will make a way for you because everybody is busy. Mm -hmm. yeah, you want to add to that? Yes, um, I agree with what Alex said. Um, yes, we belong to the Couples Fellowship. We got introduced to that when we got married. And um, we started attending, and we loved it. I mean, those days, b besides the monthly meetings, and then you go out uh, twice a year over the week for a weekend, etc. That was good until COVID came. Um, I also am a lay reader. One of the things I really wanted to do was to be a sites person. Oh. I like that kind of job. When I was in, um, when I did my first degree, I was with MPU, and I was an usher. And sorry, Methodist yeah. Presby okay. Union. These yeah. days, now they've separated the Methodist and the Presby. Yes, and I was an usher. And coming to um, Akari Church, I wanted to join the size person. But at that time, I had children who were young. Mm -hmm. We lived at OEB. I didn't see how I was coming early. I have come from uh, midweek meetings, etc. So I couldn't do that. And then we traveled and we came back. When we traveled also, at the University of Birmingham, um, we had a church, Salilk Methodist Church. I joined, we joined, and then I was a church steward. And Alex was helping with the audiovisuals. Yes, and then coming back, I said, well, why not join the lay readers? 
there were still the children coming from OEB. So I said, well, what can I do? So I decided to join the lay readers. So both of us signed up for being lay readers. And um, we've had, thanks to Dr. Fo um, and Kamasama, we've had opportunity to be lay preachers as well. Mm. So that one, I didn't choose to. to God chose me to, to do that through Dr. Mm. And I remember the first time Dr. Fo contacted me, um, I was like, did God send you? And then he said, in fact, if you permit me, I'll read that conversation to you. <laughs> no problem. I've been, I've, I've been waiting for an opportunity to read this one. <laughs> so he said, um, Dear Dr. Margaret, this is Kofi Ankama Samoa. How are you? This is an invitation to preach at a mouse uh, service, 2nd September 2018. This was 2018. And then I said, Dear Osofu, thank you for the invitation, but I'm very sorry. I can't take it at this time. The date is too close for me, and I haven't done this before, so I will need time to prepare. I am teaching two new courses this semester, a marking script, so there's a lot on my plate. Perhaps another time, sorry, and thank you. And then he said, what about 23rd or 30th? And I said, you won't let me go, will you? <laughs> and he said, the Lord has need for you to bless us through you and be blessed. And I said, you have no idea the burden on my shoulders. I'm reading this because of what I was going through at that time. Mm. And I, he said, I will pray for you, and your darling husband will support you. It shall be well. And mm -hmm. when he said, the Lord has need for you, what I asked him was, did he tell you because I'm looking for him? And he said, well, maybe he did in some unusual way. He prompted me weeks ago, and you, you will not believe it. And I said, Emino, at least he knows I am there, which means he has heard me calling him. And I said, please prompt him for me as well. I'm looking for him. I'm really looking for him. And I'm talking about looking for God. Because that was a very difficult moment in my life. This was 2018. So let me veer off from being involved in no church problem. activities. No um, that's, that's been one of the difficult moments in my life, applying um, to move up, move up the ladder in my um, career. Um, so if you, are, if you work in a university, we have something we call publish or perish. The only way you can get promoted is to publish. Yeah. So if you don't publish, yeah. general, do research and publish, you will you not perish. go up the ladder, you will perish. <laughs> so your renewal of appointment, everything is dependent on whether you get promoted or not. You need a number of papers to be able to apply from lecturer to senior lecturer. And I tried so hard. You write, it's not easy to publish a paper. Huh. <laughs> you send it and then they'll reject it. Recently, myself and a group of about eight lecturers, we sent a paper, we sent it to three different places within like a week or two, about two weeks. It's all been rejected. We are going to try again. But that is how it is. So I write, I send it, it's rejected. But the worst part is the ones that got accepted. So they say, accepted with corrections. I do the corrections. Then they come back with different corrections. And then you do it and they send it and they'll say, well, we don't see, we, we, don't, we are not interested. We, we don't want to publish it. And it, it was so difficult. It was a very trying moment. And I'd gotten to the point where now my appointment to the university was renewed on yearly basis. So you can imagine, and it's a long process. Apply 13 different copies of your application. It, it was stressful. I cried. I, I called on God. I kept asking him why. And every time I did, all he said was, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. That is all that God could tell me. So when Osofu came and said, come and preach, that is why I said, <laughs> I was looking for God. Uh. But um, on the 18th of January, 2018, we're going for a trip, my department. And that day, um, okay, the bus was full, so I joined some colleagues. And I, I sat in the car, I questioned God, I cried. Nobody knew I was crying, but I sobbed. And then I fell asleep. And then when I woke up, there were some messages on my Achimota uh, uh, school platform. Some very, some stories that, I mean, told me that some, it was basically a message from God. But one other thing, when I slept and I woke up, I read a message from a neighbor who never sends me some of those flyers. 
And all he said was that for you, my ways are not your ways, neither are my thoughts your thoughts. And then that story that I read on our platform, the conclusion was that sometimes we need to pause and stop fretting. And at that point, God told me that if you don't stop fretting and pause and relax, I cannot begin the work that I want to begin in you. <laughs> and from that 2018 January, it wasn't until 2019 January that I finally got all the papers I needed to apply for promotion. And even with that one, the numbers that you need, they want you to add a bit more, just in case they reject some of it in the process. And I remember when I took it, the person said, oh, you have the exact number. Why don't you wait and get some more? And I said, oh, I have one more coming on the way. I said, oh, you know these things. It can go and don't accept it. And I said, God will do it. I was supposed to submit my forms on 31st. And then on the 30th, I got the message that that paper had been accepted. And so I, uh, that day, I went on my knees in my office. I just raised my hand. But it took one year. When God said, you have to stop fretting, it took a year before I could put in that application. <laughs> so it's not all that easy. We come, we jump, we pray, we, we, we dance here, we laugh, but it's difficult. Sometimes it's difficult. I spoke with, I remember I spoke with Victoria Hayford, and she said it's called the wilderness experience. I, I didn't know it was called the wilderness experience. And she shared her own story with me. But um, I remember when I finished preaching, I said, God, the first time I preached, I said, God, I've done what you want me to do for you. Now you to do my own for me. <laughs> <laughs> but he did it in his own time. Now I'll end by saying that there's one thing that I noticed. The day before I my head of department, or in fact, a friend prompted me that, oh, the head of department has sent a message that your application has gone through. So I applied in January, and then it was December before everything went through. Sometimes it takes that long. Mm -hmm. I was chatting with a friend, and I was sharing with her, and then after I finished, I went to my kitchen, and I was like, God, when I started before I went to do my PhD, I was doing so well. I was doing so well. If I stayed here, I'm sure I would have been a professor by now. And all, just one thing that God told me was humility. And that was the point I realized that God wanted me to learn humility before he lifted me anywhere else. And I look back and I say, if I hadn't gone through that process, that painful process, if I hadn't learned that it is humility that God wants me to learn, and I had gone ahead and made it at that time, I would have felt that I was my own boss. <laughs> so... Trust in God, faith in God, complete reliance on God. I'm sure one day I'll tell my story at a breakfast meeting. I have it all documented, every step, everything that happened within that process. But all I want to say is, like we are talking about a well-balanced life, it is not always rosy. There are difficult moments. And um, Alex used to get worried that at a point I'll just give up my faith in God. But I said I would never give up. Whatever it is that God is doing, he should do it. And when he finishes, he should tell me. But I never gave up. I cried, I cried, but I never gave up. And he always told me, my grace is sufficient for you. And that, that's all God, God told me. Until the point where I learned that I need to relax and depend on him, wait on him. And then I learned humility. So I would never forget that lesson. If God had just said, somebody had said, you have to be humble, and that was it, it wouldn't have stuck. But having to experience all of this, all of I know what it means to be humble. Thank you. Wow. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for that, Dr. Margaret. Um, I, I, you know, I had it to mind. When I was reading your profile, I, I, I was so intrigued about how you were able to, you know, progress in academia and especially even when kids were coming in and all and because I'm currently doing my MPhil okay. at University of Ghana as well and okay. <laughs> I mean you're in academia so you know yeah. it's 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 not easy and I mean I, I'm, I'm thankful that you said what you said because it's been really encouraging and even for everyone else who may feel stuck at a certain point of their lives and they and they are just fretting and you are not sure what to do it's like if you feel like god is not coming through for you it's about stopping and then just focusing on god resting in him 
and then allowing him to do his work. And I think that that for me has been one of like the major highlights. So just wanted to thank just you. Add that, I mean, the worst part was people who had, I had taught as students, who had been my teaching assistants, who had come back to teach, were getting promoted. And I was stuck where I was. <laughs> so you can imagine. Yeah. I, my <laughs> mates now are professors mm. and directors. But you know, at the right time, God made things beautiful. Yeah. And when I became a warden, at that time I didn't know there was a warden. Mm. The term is three years and another three years. But after three years, the one there said she was going on sabbatical leave. And so um, they called for nom nominations. There were two of us. And I said, God, if this is what you want me to do, give me a landslide win. And I, I've pulled votes twice what that person pulled. And like I said, at that point, I wasn't thinking of being a warden. But God made it right. Now I'm looking at how busy I am. Uh -huh. If I get home at 6 a.m., I've not asked, 6 p.m., I've not asked, Mommy, what are you doing here? Because sometimes, now I'm on campus also, sometimes I get home very late, sometimes 9, sometimes 10, because I just want to get work done. And I look back and I realize that if I had had this position much earlier, my family would have suffered. So even though I struggled with my promotion, I, st I made time for my children. I was there for them. And I won't say they are perfect. I won't say I have a perfect family uh, relationship, but I know that I've done something good. I've built friendship with my children. And um, I know that I'm th they know I'm there for them. So at that time where there was that gap in my career, mm -hmm. my family life was building up. Mm. And I wouldn't, and I'm happy that it went that way. Now my family life is built up. Um, so you know the balance now, one is yeah. up, one is down. Exactly. Now my family life is, 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 I'm happy with what I have. And God has lifted me up and given me this position of a warden. And I'm so busy, if I had younger children, I wouldn't have been able to. So God gave me this position at the right time. And it's interesting that in my 18th year of teaching, I was elected the 18th, 18th ward. <laughs> How it happened, I don't know. But wow. I just give glory to God. Amen. Amen. Wow, thank you so, 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 so much. I think the final question <laughs> before we wrap up uh, about your hobbies, what, what you like to do in your spare time? Asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Th yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> I like sightseeing. Okay. Yeah, I like sightseeing. I do in my free time. And I'm more of an introvert. And Maggie is more of an extrovert. So I like sightseeing. And in as much as I like numbers, because of the challenge I had during my A-level national service, I've added reading <laughs> to my hobbies as well. So I like sightseeing and then reading. Most of the sites I like are natural sites. There were some times I used just to go to the beach just to observe the waves. And if I get a chance of traveling, anytime I travel, I just look for natural environment, trees and monkeys and all those things. It gives me some form of relief. I like sightseeing. Did yeah. the trekking influence that? I can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes as I enjoy nature, you see the beauty of Christ mm. in all that. And it makes me realize there's a supreme being. So I like it. Amen. Yeah. Oh, nice. What's my hobby? Um, I like to watch movies. <laughs> yes, but I like to socialize a lot. Uh, yes. Um, so, for me, I, I like I like to I like to be with people. So anything to do with being with people, events, whatever, I love to do it, and I like to be of help to people. That's what gives me pleasure. I like to serve. They call me a busybody, but I like it. <laughs> That's what makes me happy. Yes, being of service to people, I really like doing that. Yeah, but in my spare time, if I have spare time, which I don't have quite often, yes, 
I, I like to watch a movie. Even with that one, I'll watch 20 minutes and I have to get back to work. Oh. I can't continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because it's, well, it's, 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 I guess there's a lot do. to do all the time. I guess yes, mm. like I said, sometimes you sleep at 2 a.m. and you wake up at 5 a.m. Because some work has to be done. Of course, it's not, you can't continue doing that because it's not good for your health. But sometimes you have to push a bit. Mm. Yeah. So I, I like to watch movies and I like to be of service to people. That is what gives me joy. Okay. Nice. Uh, thank you so yeah. much. Um, do you I have, have one? <laughs> a quick question. Quick so one. yeah. So um, if there's anything you want to see improved in society today, Ghana, <laughs> I like the way I got mm. Alex mm. raised his head. Mm. What would what what would you like to see society do better as a collective? Yeah, for society, um, you don't know what you've got until it's gone for Ghanaians we are blessed we need to appreciate and thank God for what we have that is why probably that's why I enjoy walking around sightseeing and all those things so if any there's anything I'll need to improve in society particularly in the Ghanaian society, all I'll say is that let's appreciate what we have. Let's take good care of what we have. And in all things, let's plan, pray, and leave the rest, leave the rest to good. God. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think for me, what is really on my heart is that we change our attitude as Ghanaians. That's all I can say, our attitude. And um, we tend to blame the government, etc. But the little things we do, the indiscipline on the roads, um, the corruption, the being fraudulent and doubling prices and duping people, all of that. For me, if I want something to change, it's our attitude. I wish that we will realize that it's us. We make this nation. And if we don't change our attitude, then nothing will change. We can change how many governments. It's our attitude. And so we need to change. If something, I want something, to, and uh, be people of integrity. That's all I'll say. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, um, Doctor and Doctor, <laughs> for your time with us. Um, we picked up a lot, a lot. A lot. If I say I'm really going to go through some of my notes, <laughs> I won't finish today. But I just want to thank you so much for your time, for joining us, and for um, giving us such wise words to to guide us even in, in as we are continuing in life. And I don't know if yeah, you have some last words too. Oh, if they have any questions for us, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right? Or oh, do you actually have any questions for us before we go? No, not particularly. Okay. So, yeah, so this is just a thank you so much for your time with us. And thank you, viewers um, back home as well, for tuning in. I hope you are blessed. Um, myself and I were definitely blessed here. And do make it, make it a point to join us again next month on Legacy Series. Thank you and bye-bye for now. Yeah. Before, before you leave, we also want to say thank you for giving us the opportunity to share our story. I remember I told us of all, we are not perfect human beings. We are striving and struggling to do our best. And then what he told me was, we still want to hear the good and the bad and all the struggles you are going through. So I want to thank you also for the opportunity for us to share this. And we know by God's grace, I believe it's been a blessing to others. Yeah, I just also wanted to say thank you for the opportunity. And as I said, it's a balancing act. You can't have it all. Some some parts of your life may be good at one time, others may be down, but it's just you trying to balance it. You can't be perfect, you can't have it all, but just keep at it and um, walk with God. It's very important. Thank you for the opportunity.